Well, my purpose tonight is to give a, is to review one of the most, the most remarkable examples of engineering and design that can be found anywhere in creation, and that's the human body. Now, if we, uh, if we take the days of creation to be indicators of how much time and effort and energy went into certain aspects of the creation, then you can make an argument that the human body is as complex as the entire rest of the cosmos. Remember, God put, created all the astronomical bodies in one day, and then one day created man and the land animals. I mean, we are as complex as the entire rest of the cosmos combined, and without a doubt, the most remarkable and amazing evidences of design in the biological world can be found in the human body. Now, I just love teaching science. I teach uh, here at Cedar Park Christian Schools, and the, the reason why science can be so cool I mean, you do end up having to learn, or learn a lot of terms, you know, mitosis and meiosis and homozygous and heterozygous, all the terms we're learning right now in genetics. But there, it, can be, it can be overwhelming in the ter- that you're learning a new language, but the reason why science can be pretty cool if you teach it the right way is because what science is really exploring is God's creation. And what he made is amazing, just amazing and amazing. And, and if you look at the creation, especially through the lens of the technologies that we've developed, microscopes and telescopes, and, and the, the, what we have learned about some of these systems and, and biological systems and processes, then it should within you develop a, an appreciation for our God that's deeper than you've had before. Science can be very important for a person of faith for this reason. It can deepen your appreciation of our Father God when you come to understand what it is that he made for us and should blow you away the intellect, the wisdom that is found there as exemplified by the works that he has made. Well, again, one of the most amazing things he has made is the human body. In, In Psalms 139, King David described us this way. He says, for you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it well. You know, I've often uh, pondered this verse myself and uh, in particularly the part there where he says that I am fearfully made. We're wonderfully made. But we were fearfully made as well. And when I read this, when this, what this speaks says to me is that in making us, we caused God a bit of anxiety, a bit of fear. He was creating beings that he was going to give free will to. And when you give free will, to, when you create beings like he created us and you give them free will, you're giving them the ability to reject you to reject your moral law. Look what has ultimately happened, what he had to do. I mean, he created after creating the angels, and the angels fell. Satan himself was the angel of light, and he's creating beings and giving them free will, knowing the future. Remember, God exists outside of time, knowing the future, knowing what we were going to ultimately do, how we would reject him, how far we would fall into depravity, the terrible, wretched sin sinners that we've, we've become and that he would have to ultimately send his son to die for us, I think there was a degree of fear in that. That's how I read that verse. Well, from the microscopic to the macroscopic level, the human body possesses tremendously complex structures that are woven together, as uh, the psalmist King David describes here. We'll tour this complexity today with the goal of developing a better understanding of the interconnectedness and interdependence of the various components and systems that make up the human body, which provide a powerful example of intelligent design. We're going to begin our exploration with one of the most spectacular discoveries of our day, and that is that information governs the biological world. Information also governs the physics of the cosmos, Mathematics underlies the physics of the cosmos, but we also come to know that, fi- that information governs the biological world as well. Now, this biological information exists in the cells of all organisms as this complex molecule called DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. 
Well, this molecule carries complex coded instructions for making an entire organism. Some of the DNA is the instruction for making proteins, which are the machinery and material that make life possible. But only a small percentage of the genome is involved with making proteins. <clears throat> the rest of it has, serves various regulatory functions, like regulating the countless biological processes that are involved with development, diversity, and even gene expression. Well, today, everyone acknowledges that DNA is information. This is not a contested assertion. Everyone recognizes that it is information. Even Bill Gates said the gene is by far the most sophisticated program around. Well, the fact that DNA is coded information causes it to stand as the single most powerful argument for intelligence design that exists. Because in all past human experience, we've only found information coming from one source, and that's an intelligent mind. In all human experience, we've only found information coming from an intelligent mind. So when information was discovered to exist within the cells of all organisms, it should have led to the conclusion, or at least the hypothesis, that that information might have also come from an intelligent mind because that's how science is supposed to work. You're supposed to use your past knowledge and experience to inform your observations and reach conclusions. We've only found information coming from an intelligent mind. Well, the amount of information packed into each human cell is truly mind-boggling. Now, humans have 46 chromosomes that range in size when stretched out from 1.7 to 8.5 centimeters in length. 46 chromosomes that range in size from 1.7 to 8.5 centimeters in length. If you were to take all the chromosomes in one of your cell and attach them end to end, it would form a single strand that's about six feet in length. Well, the human body contains 100 trillion cells total, but uh, the reality is only about 60 trillion of those cells are human cells. About 40% of the total cells that make up your body are, in fact, bacterial cells. You're a huge symbiotic organism. Lots of bacteria are part of your body processes. They help you do things like digest. The, <laughs> the appendix, for example. Some people get appendicitis and have to get their appendix taken out. You, uh, you will hear various uh, functions described as, uh, for the appendix. Some say it's part of the immunity system because there's a lot of lymphatic tissue that surrounds the appendix. But what the appendix is in reality is a culturing tube for bacteria. It is an organ designed to culture fresh colonies of bacteria and add those to your large intestine. Well, anyway, you have about 60 trillion cells that are eukaryotic or human cells. If you were to take the DNA from all 60 trillion cells in your body and attach them end to end, it would form a strand that is 67 billion miles long. That would stretch to the moon and back, not just once or twice, but 140,000 times. The DNA, the information in your body would literally go to the moon and back 140,000 times. That's incredible. Well, to illustrate this another way, what you're seeing on the... Uh, Left of this image is a, the, a, mo a short model of the DNA helix. The DNA, is, the DNA molecule is like a ladder that's twisted into a shape we call the double helix. Well, each step of that ladder, each step or rung of that ladder is made up of one or four possible molecules called nucleotides that are abbreviated with the letters A, C, T, and G. The, what you see on the right side is, a, and is an example of genetic code. When we determine the sequence of nucleotides that is, makes up this code, that's what it looks like. A whole bunch of A, T, Cs, and Gs that make up a code. A code that tells, tells cells how to make proteins and do many, many other things. Well, if each letter in that genetic code is taken to be equivalent to the letters in our alphabet, then the amount of information in one human cell would fill a thousand books. There are as many letters in one human cell as there are letters in a thousand books. Or to put it another way, a little pinhead-sized pile of DNA, a pile of DNA only two millimeters in size, has as many letters as there are would be in 500 stacks of books reaching the moon, or a single stack of books 93 million miles high that would reach to the sun. And where do evolutionists believe all of this information came from? Well, they only have chance 
And the law-like processes of chemical interactions to explain the origin of this information. And so to them, they invoke uh, mutations. Random changes to the genetic code gave rise to more genetic code. They believe some genetic, some DNA strand formed magically somehow at one point in the distant past. Some cell ev or evolved through abiogenetic processes at some distant point in the past. And then through time, the amount of information gradually increased from that lowly cell, more primitive than a bacteria, up to us, that the amount of information through time increased through random changes to the genetic code. As the cells copied that code, they copied it incorrectly, leading to changes or exposures to mutagens like UV bombardment or chemicals that can alter DNA led to random alterations that increased the amount of genetic code. Well, this is one of the most ludicrous aspects of the theory of evolution, just absolutely ludicrous. It's an affront to reason, it's an affront to logic, and it's an affront to common sense to propose that random changes to a complex code would give rise to more code and better code. To propose that random changes to a letter in a, letters in a book would produce a second edition of a book or a better edition of a book is just ridiculous. And everyone knows this in your gut. You know this in your gut or in your heart that such a thing is just preposterous. It is really one of the most ludicrous things that evolution has proposed, but that's all they have. They refuse to invoke a creative process, a creative intelligence behind this information, and so random chance processes is all they have. The truth is there's overwhelming evidence of design in the biological world, and the DNA is just part of that. This is Francis Crick. Francis Crick is the, one of the co-discoverers of the DNA helix. Now, Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize in 1962 for working out the shape of the DNA helix. Now, these evolutionists will claim there's no evidence of design when arguing against creation, but when they're being honest and frank, they will admit that the, the evidence of design is overwhelming. Francis Crick said this, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but rather evolved. The evidence of design is so common in the biological world that you don't just occasionally remind yourself that what you see is not designed. You have to constantly remind yourself that what you see was not designed but rather evolved. There's overwhelming evidence of design out there in the biological world in particular. But why don't they admit to it? Why, with such evidence of design, why is it that they still trust in evolution, blind chance processes as a creative force for life on earth? Well, I think they do it because they want to believe it. Or they don't want to believe the alternative. They want to believe... <laughs> When you get right down to it, it's a terrifying thought that there is an almighty God capable of creating the cosmos that formed us and we will be answerable to that divine intelligence when we die. That we will be judged by a being capable of creating this world, a being who gave us a built-in sense of right and wrong, who's watching over us daily, considering everything we do, that we would be being judged after we die by such a being is a terrifying thought. The writer Proverbs says, is, uh, wisdom is, uh, uh, fear is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't have a little bit of fear, you're not paying attention to what's in the Bible because judgment is, God's judgment is a terrible thing. He has judged his people you know, over and over and over again through the history of the Bible. And I think some people just don't want to live with that. And they want to believe that they're just an animal, that they're going, that get, however they live is okay. They're not going to be judged when they die. They want, they want to be convinced that that's all they are, that the, store, that, the, that the creation account is not true. They want to be convinced of that. And when you want to be convinced of something, it doesn't take a lot of evidence. It doesn't take a lot of evidence to convince you of something you want to believe. But it takes, it's almost impossible to show someone enough evidence to convince them that they're wrong about something they want to believe. And that's where we are today. DNA is an overwhelmingly powerful argument and example for intelligence design. DNA.
If simple water molecules that form ice crystals exhibit magnificent structure, consider the design ingenuity behind large, complex molecules, such as DNA. DNA contains the blueprint for all life and is by far the densest information storage mechanism known in the universe. For example, the amount of information contained in a pinhead volume of DNA would fill a stack of books 500 times higher than from here to the moon. The program code and design of such an incredible system indicates a supremely intelligent designer. The evidence to me that just cries out that there's a God is the study of DNA. DNA is a very powerful, massive information storage system. In fact, DNA that makes up our genes actually is like books of information that's read by a language system. It's absolutely phenomenal. And scientists know today that language as a code only come from an intelligence and information only comes from information. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to a code. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to information. And as you look at DNA, it actually cries out in the beginning, God created the universe. We all begin as a single cell the size of a period at the end of a sentence. How does that cell know how to build a, a body with 100 trillion uh, cells in it, thousands of different kinds, and each one of them is so complex, nanochemical machinery beyond our comprehension how it works, and encoded is the, the instruction manual it's the manufacturer's manual how to build and operate every part of this incredible body made up of 100 trillion cells. Furthermore, DNA is a three-dimensional molecule that is self-replicating. Each molecule is able to make an identical copy quickly and efficiently. The Lord has even programmed DNA to detect and correct replication errors. These sophisticated capabilities far exceed man's means. God has created the DNA molecule in such a way that it is self-correcting. There are special proteins called enzymes that go up and down the DNA molecule looking for and making repairs on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. God created us with a DNA code that actually has what we call editase or editorial type enzymes. Just as an editor reads a newspaper or a book looking for mistakes, so God has created special enzymes enzymes that go up and down our DNA molecule repairing the mistakes in ways that are unbelievably complex. There are many examples in creation of, of things that demonstrate the biblical God. Uh, one would be in our very DNA. Our DNA has information in it. And there is a whole field of scientific study called information science, which studies how information originates, how it's transmitted, and so on. And one of the laws of information science says that information never originates by itself in matter, never spontaneously comes about. Anytime we trace uh, the copying of information back to its source, it always, it always comes back to a mind. And since we have creative information in DNA, that tells me that DNA comes from intelligence. It's not something that could possibly come about through millions of years of mutations and natural selection. That just won't work. Yet even the DNA molecule is simple compared to cells. All life consists of cells, and each cell functions as a miniature city. When we consider that a human body consists of trillions of cells working together as one unit, we should be in humble awe of our Creator's intimate care and perfect wisdom. Boy, it is true that cells are tremendously complex. Tremendously complex. Really, it's hard to draw an analogy to anything we've, we've encountered in human experience because it's so far more complex than anything we've made. Um, it has orders of magnitude more moving parts than like a Boeing 737 or even the International Space Station. It is tr truly like a city. It's a, about the only thing you could uh, compare it to. It's like a city, uh, that complex. It's like a city. But it's more, far more complex than the cities we've made because this is a city that can move can get up and move itself from one location to another. It's a city that can make a copy of itself. And bacteria can rep duplicate about once every 20 minutes under optimum conditions. But we can draw several interesting analogies. It has a, 
It has a structural framework like cities have, girders uh, that we see in buildings or uh, bridges. It, it actually has highway systems that will assemble and disassemble. It has countless molecular machines. Uh, some of these we call enzymes. Factories full of machines. We call these organelles like the mitochondria and chloroplast. And as armies of delivery vehicles carrying manufactured goods down the highways of the cell. This is a kinesin, one of the delivery vehicles in the cell that's carrying a package of manufactured goods, a vesicle, down one of the highways of the cell called a microtubule. There are many analogies we can draw. There's a central library of information. That's the nucleus in the background that contains the DNA, the information of the cell. And there's a system to distribute that information, which is what you see in here. You see genetic code emerging from the nucleus, being bound by one of these organelles called a ribosome that will read the code, and, which is an instruction that tells this organelle how to make proteins. It is far more complex than anything else we've encountered. It's, uh, it, in reality, is like a city of complexity. Well, the cell is full of complex machines like the kinesin I showed you that was transporting its package down a microtubule highway. Countless cellular and other biological structures offer a powerful argument for intelligent design called irreducible complexity. Now, an irreducibly complex structure, uh, like even a ma simple mousetrap that you see here, is one that has multiple required parts and one where even the removal of any one of those parts would cause a system to cease functioning. So an irreducibly complex structure has multiple interacting parts and that all have to be there, have to be there at the exact same time, have to be assembled together and energy has to be applied to it for it to work. Now such irreducibly complex structures simply cannot be built in a way that Darwin described. They cannot be built through numerous successive site modifications over countless generations in a Darwinian mechanism. And even Darwin says this. He says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find out no such case. He didn't say it would suffer harm or that it might uh, break down. It said it would absolutely break down if we could find such a thing. But we can. The molecular machines themselves, like that kinesin, are irreducibly complex. They cannot be built through numerous successive slight modifications. Every single part has to be there, and it has to be there at the exact same time. Well, from the microscopic to the macroscopic level, the human body possesses irreducible complexity that defies evolutionary explanation of origin. There are an estimated 100 trillion cells that make up the human body, Again, about 40% of those bacteria. But of the human cells, they exist in a number of highly specialized types that cannot live independently of each other. Some of these we're going to discuss later. But you have cells like the nerve cell, the neuron that you see there. We're going to be seeing the neuron. Neurons have to have nurse cells with them called glial cells. <clears throat> The hair cell that you see there is not a cell that makes hair, but one of the cer cells that's involved with both hearing and balance. They do, those hairs detect movement. These are highly complex cells. The muscle cell that you see there is involved with contraction or shortening. And by shortening, they accomplish everything in the human body from moving the skeletal system, moving bones so that we can, we, uh, can move around. They move, uh, they, they move air in and out of your lungs by the contraction of the diaphragm. They move food around in your digestive system. <clears throat> you have the cone cell there, one of the photoreceptors in the eye. We're going to talk about those as well. Interestingly, though, all of these cells have the exact same DNA. They have the exact same DNA. They're assigned their roles early in embryonic development. Certain different genes are turned on in one cell versus another, causing them to become these specialized forms, a uh, process that is still largely not understood. Well, some of these specialized cells uh, mentioned previously form tissues. For example, connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle and nervous tissue. All four of these tissues must be present in most organs. Most organs are made up of these four tissues. For example, even the stomach. 
It has a skin, an epithelial tissue. It has some muscular tissue that's involved with churning your, churning your food. It has some nervous tissue that's involved with a muscular contraction. And it will have connective tissue that binds it to the surrounding organs. Even the heart it has these four kinds of tissues. Or the liver. Now, the liver is uh, often called the body's chemical factory. And uh, it is called that because it performs many of the chemical reactions that are necessary in the body. And today, scientists have identified over 500 functions of the liver. 500 separate functions of the liver. Let me show you just a few of these. It regulates the composition of the blood, including the amounts of fat, uh, protein, and sugar. Glucose is involved with regulating your blood sugar level. It removes toxins from the blood, like, album like alcohol, ammonium, or bilirubin, which is produced from the breakdown of red blood cells. It processes, or what we call metabolizes, most of the nutrients for the body. It stores some nutrients, such as vitamin A, iron, and uh, some minerals. It produces things like cholesterol and some important proteins, such as albumin. And it produces some of the blood clotting factors needed for blood coagulation. So as you can see from these functions, the liver is integrated into multiple biological systems. You can't really, it's hard to figure out what system of the body you're going to discuss the liver in. Often it's included within digestive, the digestive system, but it is involved in multiple biological systems. Not just digestive system, but the circulatory system, the excretory system, and the endocrine system. All of the biological systems are irreducibly complex in that they rely on multiple components to function and are integral to other systems. Let's read.